good morning. Good morning. That was actually pretty good. Usually I have to go, come on, it's a better morning than that. Uh, it's a good morning. A lot, of, I, a lot of times I think it just has to do with uh, attitude. And uh, Most of you know, uh, well, some of you know, you saw it on Facebook, I broke down in the middle of like a back road of Pennsylvania today, this week. It was awesome, right? Yes. But I decided I wasn't going to let that, you know, get me down. And uh, I, I had a great conversation with a tow duck driver. I met some awesome people at the garage. I got to support them with lots of cash. Uh, but I also got to see an incredible car that was worth about a half million dollars. So uh, not my car. The Honda Civic is worth a half dollar. Uh, I actually, you know, yeah. My tires are more expensive than the car. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, anyway, that's nothing to do with the message today, anyway. Uh, but we're doing a series. We, we kind of took a break, and it's been a few years since we did this. And we talked about it. There's three words we talk about all the time here. And, and maybe you're like, I don't even remember these three words. We talk about gather, grow, and engage. And, and so we talked about what it means to gather. Why do we get together? Why do we do this thing called church? Which is always a funny sermon to preach. Because you're preaching to people about why it's important to come to church. But the people who are here are the ones at church. Um, I mean, maybe it's convicting for the people listening to the video podcast. Shout out to Devin. Uh, you know, <laughs> some of our deployed guys. I mean, you know, but it, it's, it's always kind of funny. And uh, last week we talked about what it means to grow. And I gave you guys an awesome gift the church did. If you want Yay! To Is that, I, I, I noticed I can actually creepily tell if you've logged in and checked that out. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of you were like, oh, I want it. And haven't looked at it at all yet. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm, it's between you and God, but I'm watching. Uh, no, uh, just, just some tools, because a lot of times we tell people to grow in their faith, but we don't give them a way to do it. And, and so we're looking for some, some tools that would help you do that in, in a cool format, and uh, hopefully we'll have some classes coming up uh, with all that. And so the, the third, this, so we talked about gather, we talked about grow, and today we're going to talk about the word engage, and everyone here is going to get engaged. Yeah. All right. Put a ring on it. No, okay. Uh, you know, it was, it's funny because you know we kind of we really thought hard about which words, which three words to use. We've been using these for a while, but but really, I, I like this word engage. And, and really, you know, life is complicated. Faith and church shouldn't be. And the reason we call it simple church because if you're a part of this this thing we call church, because again, I. I hate that, you know, here's the church, here's these people, yeah. but I'm still the people. Lies. Right. From the pit of hell. Uh, <laughs> this is not a church. This is the building which the church meets. And I will awkwardly say things to you. I'll be like, meet in the place at which we gather on Sundays for worship. <laughs> you know, I, I almost, every once in a while I'll slip. I think I owe somebody coffee once for accidentally calling this a church. This is just the building we have to meet in. We don't own it. It's a basement. <laughs> uh, it looks it's like the Doctor Who booth, too, because you don't realize how much there is to do it until you get in here, right? right? Like, the first time people come down, they're like, oh, it's a small church. And then you're like, oh, well, it's bigger than it looks. And then, then you find out there's, oh, there's a giant nursery over here. And oh, if you go through here, there's a big kid's church here. And, you know, it's, it's like Doctor Who. Some of you get the Doctor Who reference, some of you not so much. And you're like, I don't know who this is. I don't know who this is. <laughs> but really, if you, if you live out and you do these three things... Uh, I think it really captures a lot of what the, the life of following Jesus is supposed to, to look like. And, and so I'm going to jump into John chapter 17, and the, the scriptures will be up here. Uh, you can follow along there. Uh, you can also follow along in version if you want. Uh, so John chapter 17, this is Jesus. So that's usually a good indication. Which, not that you shouldn't listen to the rest of the Bible, but when Jesus is actually saying something, you should really focus on uh, So this is Jesus. He's praying. He says, now I'm coming to you. I, to I told them many things while I was with them in this world so that they will be filled uh, with my joy. And, and so Jesus is like preparing to leave. He's preparing the early church, his, his disciples. He goes, I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. So there's this, this tension that, you know, not everybody was on the Jesus, you know, float. You know, every, like, there are people who were into Jesus, there were people who hated Jesus. That's sort of ha what has to happen for you to get crucified. Everyone loves you, you're not getting crucified. Um, and so, he said, you know, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth, teach them your word, which is truth. And see, I think a lot of churches stop there because we want holiness. And I come from a holiness tradition. And if you know that, it's like you just you, you don't want to be polluted by the world. So you like 
you don't go to movies. And I, I remember I, <laughs> I remember I had a friend who like from the church. They told if you were in a movie and Jesus came back, you didn't go. And, and, then, and she's telling me about going to the movies and getting out and calling somebody afterwards to make sure Jesus hadn't showed up. And they got left. I'm like, that must be like really good movie. Like if you're, you're risking not being taken with Jesus to the point where you have to call somebody, you know. And it's you know, if you grew up in those traditions too, it's kind of scary. Like I remember, uh, you know, I really came to faith in that tradition, and then it's like you're, you're kind of nervous at any point. Like, did I miss it? Like I'd wake up and like. I better call someone who I know is a believer, you know. In those days, we didn't have cell phones. You couldn't like do a group text, like hey, everybody's still here. Uh, you, you had to actually call on this thing. It was a phone. And, and some of you who are young, or younger don't realize this, but phones are actually used to make phone calls too. You can do more than text. Um, anyone? Like I saw one of those things on Facebook this week. It's like you know the things. You know that you know show your old like things that you used to do as a kid. And, you know, I was thinking talk on a phone, yeah. uh, AOL you know? Instant Messenger. Yeah. Yeah. I heard they're shutting down. They said, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to log into my account today just to see if any. There'll be like no friends available. And, and that. Anyway, but you know, sometimes people try to like distance themselves from the world, which is good on the one hand because sometimes you know people, places, and things. Sometimes you need to separate yourself from things, but you don't separate yourself entirely from the world. It says, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself the holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Uh, not out of this world, but Jesus sends us into the world. And a lot of times we get the holiness part right, and we you know, we're separate from sin, but then we feel like we're separate from everybody. And it's funny because when you first come to know Jesus, most of you, you know, you're, you're still pretty jacked up. I mean, some of you are still really jacked up now. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole other sermon. But, you know, we, you know, we, we, we kind of aren't at our best. But then over time, we get to the point where we don't know anybody who's not a believer. And that's usually when you really begin to look like Jesus and it's kind of a shame because when you look the most like Jesus is when you're the least likely to know anyone who needs Jesus. <laughs> and that's, that's not a, a biblical command. It's just a natural pattern in, in the way we do things. But we're made to make a difference where we are. We're made to make a difference. I don't live next to all of you. I live next, you know, right you know, by my family. But, you know, I, you know, I don't live next to you. So you live next to people who need Jesus. You, you, you work, I don't work where you guys work, uh, you know, you work, you know, next to some people who need Jesus. You, you know, you, and everywhere we go, there, there's people who need uh, the, the, the gospel, and, and we're all, we're, we're out in the world, and the world should look better and different because of that. You know, Jeremiah 29, 7. Now, all, you guys got all excited because you thought I said Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> you know, that, that's the one we, anyone know that one? For God so loved the world. <laughs> no, 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 that's John 3.16. I know the song is going to be in the right way. I know, I'm like, oh, my God. Well, I think because I'm in John. Oh, my God. We got a little John in the, the brain. I that I think of you. Right. Thank the Lord. That's a world of you. Yeah, we love that, right? Yes. Yes. Although it's interesting because in the context, some really I'm bad gone. things are happening and they're in exile and like the world's falling apart. But I'm hey, gone. I got plans for you. We, we like the plans part. We just don't like the exile and, and things going on. But right before that, um, and at first, it probably you, if you've read Jeremiah, you overlooked because you forgot about it when you had 11. It says, and, and, the, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. And the peace and prosperity. And the, the underlying word there is, you know, peace is shalom. Yeah. Uh, most of us know the, the, the Hebrew word shalom used as greeting. Uh, maybe you don't spend a ton of time in Israel. I've never been to Israel. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's shalom. It, it's your well-being, your peace, have everything intact. And it doesn't mean in our lives that everything is good and, you know, fine and dandy. Because there, there's times I have the peace of God despite situations that are falling apart, despite, you know, being stranded on the side of the road and you're sitting, <laughs> you know, and trucks whizzing by you at high rates of speed. Because if you've ever been on 41, it's like, man, I was on the downhill because my car broke down and I coasted till I stopped. And so all the trucks are coming down at like, you know, 80 miles an hour trying to get enough speed to go on the uphill. Um, 
you know, and it's not in the midst of good things, but it's in of bad things. This is and work for the peace and prosperity of the city. You know, <laughs> we're, we're supposed to, and they were in exile. They were in a city that wasn't there. You know, they, they were, they were just, they, they, you kind of feel out of place. That's really, you know, the Bible says we're aliens and strangers. We're in a place that we're really not, this really isn't our world. You know, because things can be falling apart, but that's okay, because my hope is not in here. It's, my hope is in something else. And, and so, when you're there, though, the world should look better. We should be working for the peace of the city in which we live. We should be working to make things better. Um, now, we talk about a story a lot, and I'm going to talk about it again today, uh, because it, it's really, it's one of those stories I think is multifaceted, and it's, it's like a diamond, you know, and they cut it, it looks pretty, all these different things, all kind of different angles. Uh, and, and so, and we're going we're gonna to jump to Luke chapter 10. It's a very familiar, um, some of you are going, yeah, I know that one already. Jeff talks about it so much, I already know when he says Luke 10 where we're going. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of a joke. Do you, do you guys want to hear the joke? No. No. Do it. No. 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 Yes, you have to. Okay, we won't tell the joke. Uh, I'll tell later. Anyway. So it says, you know, this is, this is Jesus. It says, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question, right? Jesus is on the scene. Everyone's following him. He's kind of got some, like, newer interpretations of things. They've kind of gotten in a religious rut. And so they're asking. Now, we don't know. It could be to test him, like, see if he's got the answer right. You know, it, it could be to test him to go, hey, I'm really curious what this Jesus guy has to say. Uh, and it says, you know, Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Which is a Semitic way of saying, how do you understand it? Like, not how do you read it. Um, uh, that's kind of a funny way to say things. But there, it says, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your strength, with all your mind, love your neighbors yourself. Sound good? Sound familiar? Yeah. We like that, right? Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. And, and that's, like, that's a good answer. You should stop. It's like in, you ever in class you've answered the right by the teacher and then you get cocky and think you could say something after your original comment and comment the teacher's like oh good job and then you say something they're like you idiot like you, know, you, know, you should just stay quiet after that you, you impressed me you should have stayed there uh, and it says the man wanted to justify his actions so he asked Jesus and who is my neighbor because you kind of wonder, okay, if I can paraphrase that, love God, love others, love God, love your neighbor, well, who's my neighbor? Like, who, who can I not love? <laughs> you know, who, who am I okay with that I'll still be okay with God if, if I sort of don't, don't love him? And Jesus replied with a story. And this is the one that's very familiar. If you've, if you've, if you've ever been to church, you've probably heard this one. <laughs> it's the parable of the good Samaritan. And we say good Samaritan, we think, when we think, when we hear Samaritan, we think what? Good. <laughs> because, you know, it's just naturally. Now, you have to remember, the Samaritans were, like, they would have been the people that religious leader would have liked the least. Some of you think about Republicans. <laughs> Some of you think about Democrats. <laughs> Some of you, I don't know, no one hates the independents. I just, you know, they don't pay attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like, think of, you know, like we are in the age of, like, everybody, like, hates her. I mean, I can't tell you how many times a day I read on Facebook. And I'm getting, I'm getting sick of Facebook because it's like, you know, if you don't like this, unfriend me. Yeah. Um, and a friend of mine posted that, and my, my friend's like, uh, another friend of mine is like, oh, I disagree with you, but I really like a lot of what you have to say, and I believe you have character. So although I disagree with you, I'm not going to unfriend you. Uh, and I was like, I clicked like to that. So I'm like, yes. <laughs> like you can have different opinions and not. A, and, but these were the people, the Pharisees, the religious teachers, they unfriended them. Any of the uh, people who were Samaritans, they were like not accepting friend requests. We don't like them. You know, we, we just want to surround ourselves with people who think just like us and believe just like us. And, you know, and, and that's, it's great on the one hand because it protects you from, like, the polluting influence of those people, right? But it also it makes it so you can't influence those people for good. And so the, the, the servants are out. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he says, and Jesus tells the story. He says, Jewish man is traveling to Jerusalem down to Jericho and is attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, left him half dead beside the road. Not a good thing. Like, I broke down the Civic, I was not beaten. I just, you know, I was there. Uh, priest came along, and what does he do? He crossed to the other side. He says, you know, a temple assistant walked over, see him there. 
pass by on the other side. And, and you kind of think, this is, you know, sometimes you can do in America, you can stop to help somebody, and they're robbing you because they just like, you know, they put the lady out there, like, oh, I can't fix the time. Not that women can't, but, you know, it's, you know, men, oh, yeah, I need help. And then someone's got a gun, and, you know, I mean, think, and that's like maybe that kind of thing. They're thinking, you know, hey, the guy's laying there, but, like, are the bandits still around? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop to help, and there's going to be problems, or, you know, or I think of the veggie tales, busy, busy, terribly busy. So you see, and you can watch that on the right now thing if you sign up. So, so you can fill that out on the next card. Uh, and, and so some of you were like, what is he talking about? Uh, just trust me. It was funny if you were little and, you know, ate and, like, animated vegetables. <laughs> And so the, the despised Samaritan came along, and he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over, he soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandage, and that's like the first date of the day. He put the man on his own, that's like the essential oils. That's where we get the biblical mandate for us. Some of you get that, some of you don't. <laughs> so, you know, the next day, uh, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, so he said, take care of the man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you. Next time, they didn't have credit cards, so he's like, hey, you know, you know I'm good. I come back and forth here. I'll pay for this guy. You take care of him. I can't, like, carry him on a stretcher away. And Jesus says, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who attacked the bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. See, you know, <laughs> who is my neighbor? Jesus describes the action acting neighborly. Who, it's not about location. It's about how you act and interact with people. And, and we look for, you know, who can I exclude? Jesus always looks for who can I include? Yeah. You know, and, and go and do the same. Uh, now, you know, it's, it's interesting. In Matthew 25, um, I left my other Bible at home, so I got the nice, we have these. Actually, you can get these for free in the back. Um, so this is my advertisement for free Bibles we'll give you, because uh, we want you to grow. Um, watch the little go on after this. <laughs> so uh, in, in Matthew chapter 25, um, you know, it's talking about the end of time, there's judgment. We don't like that part of the Bible. We like the Jesus. We like our best life now. But we don't necessarily want to know that there's going to be a judgment. Eventually, though, you're going to be judged for the way you live your life. It doesn't mean, you, you know, we all make mistakes. We can all get better. But you know, kind of consistently, how you just choose to live will, will affect some things. And it says, um, you know, uh, starting, it says, uh, I'm going to, I'm trying to think where I want to start. 31. Um, you know, so there's this judgment. It says, uh, uh, then the king will say to those on my right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. The righteous ones will reply, Lord, when would we ever see you hungry? and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink. Which I always think is funny, because I would be like, I would just think, oh good, I get it. I wasn't sure I did, but you know, I'm, I'm on the good side. So they, they're kind of asking for clarification. I'd be afraid he'd say, oh wait, you're in the wrong group. Uh, <laughs> it says, uh, I, 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 I tell you the truth, when you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. And, and then he says the opposite, too. So the people who chose not to do this, and when you didn't do it, for the, at least my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Now, here's the funny thing about theologians. We kind of take that and go, well, Jesus said brothers and sisters, so is he talking about believers? You know, and, and, or is he talking about unbelievers? And we'll have these big theological debates. I wrestle with scripture and things because I want to be sure I'm interpreting it correctly. And we're, you know, I'm not going to, Spend the whole afternoon. That would be actually be a good sermon too. But you know, here's the thing. I think sometimes when we're digging in that and we're asking, it's really asking the same question the Pharisees are asking: Who can I exclude? Who can I include? I tell you what. Just you know, feed and clothe and help everybody, and let God sort it out. Sort of like the Marine Corps thing, but different. <laughs> let God sort it out. We'll, we'll figure out when we did the right and when the bad. Right. Some of you get that from a T-shirt in the eighties. Uh, but you know, it's you know. Just help everyone you come across. Because the world should look better when believers act like Jesus. I don't think Jesus would be like, oh, wait, you're hungry and thirsty? Oh, but you don't believe in me. <laughs> you know, so we're not going to do that. And you, uh, you know, it, it, it's about your faith should make you look and act differently. Um, James chapter 2. 
I said, you know where it's coming here. <laughs> uh, what, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you had faith but don't show up by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well, but then don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? I mean, think about the craziness of that. You know, someone's standing outside, they have no coat, they're freezing in the wind, and you're like, oh, I hope you stay warm, and walk away. Uh, it does, I mean, you might as well just say, I don't care if you freeze, and walk away. Uh, you know, um, see, see, use this for number 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith and others have deeds, but I... But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God, good for you. Even demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish, can't you see that faith without deeds is useless? Now, it's funny, because <laughs> I've had the opportunity to go to lots of you know uh, classes and seminary and stuff, which is like... This big, I know, seminary sounds like, I don't know what it sounds like, the cemetery. I know I didn't go to a cemetery to learn anything. Uh, but you know, I, I remember, like, city classes, even sem seminary, they're like, yeah, they're like, they're talking about how Paul talks about it's all, all by faith and how that's different than James because, you know, James is talking about faith and it takes work. So they try to, like, make you think real hard this is a contradiction. Uh, that's the kind of stuff scholars do. I don't know why. Because there really isn't a contradiction. Because Paul would say, you know, if you have faith, you'll live differently. And that's the thing that James is saying. If you have faith, you will live and you will act differently. And, and so I, I think a lot of times Christians historically in America have done a good job of saying, I have faith and therefore I will live differently at home. I will, you know, I, I, I will act differently. I will think internally differently, which is good stuff. But we also have to act differently in the world. The world should look like a better place because you're here. If it's not, you may not be living the way you're supposed to be living. You know, it, it should be a better place. Um, um, you know, faith in Jew. You know, we're not right, made right with by with God by anything we do. It's purely by faith. But true faith will change the way we live. Um, now, I don't know about some of you. I believe in George Washington. And I, I, but because of that, I've never chopped down a cherry tree. You know, I, I've never thought about fighting the British. Uh, you know, I, I, you believe in like historical figures, but they don't really do anything for you, right? right? And I think sometimes that's how we treat Jesus. We believe in him, but it doesn't affect our actions. But you know, faith in Jesus means we do what he did. We, we live the way he did. We're not like, oh, I believe in George Washington. Let me get some wooden teeth. <laughs> uh, although with you know my insurance, I might have to. Um, <laughs> So I come in, I got termites or something, you know, don't, don't hate on me. Uh, but, you know, we should live differently. You know, someone once called it unemployed faith. You, know, you have great skills and knowledge, but nothing to do. Um, you know, we're, we're made to live differently. And, and faith will make you move and engage the world. You can't separate faith from action. It's like peanut butter and jelly. It just goes together. You know, it, it, it's like, you know, uh, chocolate and peanut butter, man, pizza and cheese, eggs and scrapple, eggs and bacon. See, all my, all my examples are food, I figured out. You know, I was going to say coffee with milk, but real people just drink, just drink black. <laughs> just saying. No, you can, you can have creamer. We do have creamer for those of you. Who, you know, I, 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 I just love black, regular black coffee. Anyway, but, you know, uh, you know. Telling a Christian they can't engage and act differently in the world should be like telling a fish they can't have water. It just it doesn't make sense. We we should live differently yes. because of that. It's like telling a lion not to hunt. You know, we're, we naturally should be engaging and changing the world. Uh, and the thing is, you know, here's the thing. Those are, that's, those are big words, change the world. But, you know, we all start small. It's like some, some of you, I mean, those of you who are local, you remember Kent Swim Club? 
Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the Y outdoor pool now, but for those of us who were kids, it was like the Kent Swim Club, and it was like, I remember like being a little kid there, and like the little kiddie pool, which is like 50% urine, 50% water, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's true. But you kind of, you, you're in that little, they didn't have swim diapers in my days, it was just, you know. Uh, it's disgusting when I think of it. I think that's what's preparing you for the rest of the life. Of, of but you know, you're in that little kiddie pool. I remember like looking at the big pool, like, I can't wait till someday I can be in the big pool. But I had to do my time in the kiddie pool before then I was allowed in the shallow end. And you know, you, you, you like you weren't allowed past the rope. And really the rope was getting kind of slippery and like sliding underneath. You probably shouldn't even go to the rope. But you know, I had my time where I was allowed in the, in, in the, in the and they didn't really watch us in those days. They just let the lifeguards try to pull you out. Like, I mean, today parents are like watching. You know, those days it was like, oh, they probably won't drop. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then over time though, I got to like go and, and I got to swim in the deep end. And then they used to have this thing called adult swim. Where like only adult, I remember the first time they did adult swim and I realized, well, I am 18. I don't, am I allowed to go in the adult swim now? Like, uh, I guess I can. You know? But you know, then I could go in the adult, and then, now like, like when my kids were little, there's adult swim, I'd go in and just go, nah, nah, I can go in, you can't. But it, it's this progression, and that's the way it is. You know, we say you can change the world, but it might start small. You might be in the kiddie pool. I, I, and you're faithful and you do those things, and then you go, you, you kind of move up to the shallow end. You can be faithful and do things that God's calling you and things that God puts in your path to do, and eventually you'll do those big things. You'll be in the big pool. You can create, it's not all life changing moments are like, I'm in front of a thousand people preaching in Africa, which would be awesome. Some of you should go do that. It's fun. But, but, so, sometimes the big things are just going to be the people you know. It's going to be the clients you have. It's going to be the, 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 your family. And you can, you can impact people in the world. But you have to live differently. You have to engage the world. Um, and, and God will put people in your everyday life. You'll have the opportunity to live out your faith. And some of it, some of it's for the family at home. You're going to be a witness where you live. And if you're a young mom with kids, we got lots of those. We have babies running all over this place. <laughs> I, I love that. You know, we don't we don't care. Like babies cry a little bit. You know, I would rather be in a church with lots of babies and you know making noises and running around. But you know, for moms who are like with little kids, sometimes your life is just having little kids and diapers right now. That's okay. You're going to make a difference. You're going to engage that world. But even then, you might engage and connect with other moms who are going through the same thing. You can be an encouragement to them. And, and so, you know, your, your, your scope may not be as big as it was before, but you still you have a place where you can make a difference. And, and some of us, it's going to be being a witness to, to the other people in our family because of this changed life that we have. You know, and, and you know, we want you to engage here at Deep Water. We have places you can volunteer. Uh, but, we, we, you know, you can lead a group, you know, but here's the thing, it's not my intention today to have a volunteer drive and go, we have these slots we need filled. I mean, we do. We, we need people who do nursery. We need people who do kids' church. We need people to greet people at doors, that kind of thing. But, you know, um, but here, it, it's not just here. And that's why we chose not serve, because I think sometimes serve, people get the connotation, like for that third word, gather, grow, engage. It's because I think when people hear serve, they think serve at the church. Yeah. And, but, and we want you to serve here. Don't, don't get me wrong. We want you to engage. The people. We need people to run this thing. You know, we need people to pull out the extra chairs when it was a little, a little, a little tight today. We need those things. But we want you to engage the world on a bigger level. The community and the world should look different. You know, we need people who are godly coaching Little League. We need people who are godly coaching soccer. We, we, we need people who are followers of Jesus leading Cub Scouts and Girl Scouts. And, and there's lots of opportunities. And then as a church... It was funny. I was actually told one time, they're like, you know, you guys certainly do a lot outside. <laughs> because, you know, we, we do some stuff internally. We do some things to help you grow. We do those things. But we always want to be an outwardly focused church. And we want to lead things and act a little differently, you know. Uh, you know, and yesterday, uh, this week we fed during the week. So we, we fed people in interfaith uh, during the week. Some of you were here. Uh, we, then Saturday, yesterday, we, you know, people fed at Salvation Army. You know, we, we literally are feeding the hungry. <laughs> and and there's, there's lots of those opportunities and things you can do. Uh, <laughs> but but here's really the thing. You're really needed in all three places. You're needed in the home. Wherever your relations are, and sometimes people like kind of they'll do the engage outside because they want to avoid engaging at home. 
But you, you need to work on that. Uh, you know, I, I, I really, I firmly believe in being, as a believer, being connected in a community of people. Uh, and there's some things we do that we get together, we do community, uh, be, because, you know, <laughs> things need to, uh, uh, you know, we, we, that, 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 that gathering is, is important. But, and then also you're needed out in the world. You're really needed in all three places. Um, now, I think the question I always have asked about since we started this church, you know, uh, you know, some years, like your question is, what is deep water? Why would we choose that? That's a whole other thing. But, but you know, why would anyone miss deep water? Because you know, there's, there's a, I can't remember who originally asked the question, but they asked the question. You know, if your church closed down next week, would anybody who didn't go to your church care? And if the answer is no, then you're probably not living the way Jesus would have us to live. We should be engaged in changing the world around us. You know, I, I think churches sometimes we're known more for what we're against than what we're for. We picket, we protest uh, versus doing some things. Um, now, I'm going to bring up an example of something. Some of you know we did it. And... Um, you know, I'm going to call out Justin for a second. And Justin, I think you were like at a school board meeting, found out Central Middle School, had big holes in the classrooms, things hadn't been fixed, so what do we do? He grabs Bob and I, we go, and we fixed the classrooms because they had big holes in the walls and they needed to be painted, and we just feel like as, as a church, we want to be a gift to our community, so we wanted to help. Now, I don't even know, I mean, we do know some Central Middle kids. I didn't know, okay, well, our Central Middle kids are going to be in this room or that, and we let's get the class rods. We just grabbed three rooms that needed, I don't even know if we were smart about which ones. We just chose three. <laughs> but here's the thing. That, Sorry. it's okay. I'm just going to count that as an amen. <laughs> it's allergy season. We got sneezes and snorts and all kinds of things. But here's the thing. Central Middle School, three classrooms look a lot better this year than they did last year because we did something. And we have some opportunity to do some more, and we'll open that up to some more people. First time was kind of a, t a trial and a test. Uh, but, you know, we, we want to be the kind of church that does things and works for the peace, works for the shalom, works for the city that we're in. And it doesn't even matter that it's Dover. It could be in Camden. It could be in Wyoming. It could be in Smyrna. We, we want to be the kind of church that does good for our community. And we're not even asking for anything back. You know, we just went and served. And, and the, you know, but they know, hey, that's that church that just came and did I was in a meeting, and they're like, we're talking about something. I was like, yeah, we're, you know, i got to go because we got to do this thing. We're fixing up the classrooms at Central Middle. And they're like, why, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, we found out that it needed to be done. And so, like, so you just found out it needed to be done and you went to do it. I'm like, yeah. They're like, so you just found it. It was like clarification. Like, yeah, we just did it because you know, it needed to be done. Because that surprises people because people are always looking for what's the angle and what's right. in it for me. Right. You know, do you get your name on a plaque there? Do you? <laughs> but it's not about that. I almost didn't want to tell anybody we're doing it because we just want to do it. Bless the teachers, bless the administrators, bless the students. And that's the kind of things we need to do. Not to say we all have to go out and patch holes at Central Middle. Maybe we do. But <laughs> the point is, we engage the world, we change things. If we have a faith that's really in us, that changes the way we look and see the world, then it should change the way we interact with the world, and the world should look like a better place. Now, this is another passage, which uh, it's in the U version. I, I love it. Um, <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, but I'm going to read it in the message translation. Um, it, it, it's funny because, you know, the message is a good translation. He's a good scholar, but, you know, sometimes people are like, it's we all worrying and everything. This is one passage that I think he really nailed better than any translation in English. It's a really, if there's, the, the last part's a really tough Greek uh, to translate, but uh, Peterson nailed it here. Uh, it says, even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralists, loose living, immoralists, the defeated, the moralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. 
I did this all because of the message. And here's the, the best translation of this last verse. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Wow. See, you can talk about faith. You can talk about being a church that changes the world. You can talk about engaging, or you can be in on it. And the cool thing about the gospel is we don't just talk about it. We get to be in on it, doing the things that Jesus would do in this world. So I encourage you, let's be in on it. As the band comes back to play, um, 